what I'm going to do today is, uh, given that you know we're all sharing something in common, which is you know research and interest in in the sharing economy, what I'd like to do is to give you an overview of the different types of studies that I've uh, engaged in, and uh, the purpose of that is to to really show the different perspectives that one could have on it, both in terms of qualitative versus quantitative. At the same time, market entrance, meaning sharing platforms versus incumbents and uh, uh, regulatory issues, as Kuhn uh, mentioned, versus uh, the, the institutional strategies that some of these market entrants use. And uh, throughout all of that, what I'll also try to do is give you a bit of the informal story of each of the research projects and um, give you a sense of what I would not do again and what um, has been difficult, because I think some of these are really common challenges that we might all face. And um, you know, to the extent possible, I'll also offer some solutions. In terms of the agenda, and I hope that you can see, I see that there's uh, TVs around, the kinds of things that I've done on this particular uh, setting is, first of all, I've looked extensively on market entry of sharing platforms. My research has always been about strategy and entrepreneurship, and particularly in the tech settings. I've started out with looking different mobile uh, sectors, uh, mobile gaming being one when it was just coming out, and then mobile payments, which was, again, a very ecosystem uh, perspective, because that particular technology required different kinds of players, including banks and, um, and uh, technology platforms, as well as, um, as fina financial institutions, different kinds of financial institutions, and uh, mobile operators, handset makers, to actually collaborate within an ecosystem. So this kind of ecosystem perspective has always been part of my research. And here, I think the ecosystem it, it is, it, a bit larger in the sharing economy because we need to think about regulation and the institutional actors as well. Because as we see from you know all uh, around the world, data comes in, you know, in London and of course you know in Holland there's been also a lot of debate both in terms of uh, you know ride sharing and uh, accommodation sharing among other things. There is a lot of issue in regulation not being apt for what's happening. And so that's something that we try to capture in terms of you know, what is that interplay and what are the platforms doing in order to influence regulation and to what extent is regulation playing a responsive game versus a proactive game, right? Growth of sharing platforms is, of course, quite interesting. And here, maybe uh, the, the story that is typically told is a platform story. Sharing platforms are platforms, they're digital platforms, and so platform rules apply. A lot of research is on, on that particular phenomenon of the platform itself. So the theoretical angle is very much the platform theory, right? But there's other aspects of it which I think they, they deserve attention. And here, again, I think the, the, the interplay with regulation plays uh, quite a nice angle for the research. And I'll uh, tell you a little bit about uh, the kinds of studies that I have done in that area. And throughout all of this, hopefully, I'll also share uh, some, some tips and, um, let's say, uh, takeaways for some of the things that are difficult to do in sharing economy research. First of all, the market entry of sharing platforms. Sharing platforms have different ways of entering the market, and some ways are more successful than others, but these ways are also, they, they can be entirely different even within one sector or across sectors. And so in the first study that, uh, that we've done, we have looked at this difference between market entry strategies. In particular, this study which uh, came out in the in Academy of Management Discovery's special issue on sharing economy, looks at Uber versus Airbnb as market entrance. And in particular, looking at Uber versus Airbnb, not just in one country, which of course you need to compare them in the same country for, for, have, for not comparing apples and oranges, but in three different countries. So it's a two by three in a sense, right? 
And so here, and again, you know, with my uh, lovely co-author, who is now taking a picture of our slide, um, we have looked at uh, UK, Netherlands, and Egypt. And, you know, we have to admit that there was a little bit of a serendipity in choosing these, because as he is here um, at in Utrecht, and I'm in the UK, and I've been uh, the academic advisor of the Sharing Economy Association of UK uh, for the last three years. So I work with them, I consult with them, and at the same time, time I do research with them. So I interview the sh sharing platforms there. So these two countries were kind of very uh, kind of easy to have access to. But it was also nice that the government's approach to regulating the sharing economy started to really diverge in these two countries. And in uh, the Netherlands, in the case of the Netherlands, what we see is that the government had a much more laissez-faire approach you know, we'll do it as we see necessary, but let it develop, and then if we see any problems, then we'll address it. Whereas in the UK, a specific task force was assigned, and a, a, a one of the sharing platform founders was given the commission of starting a trade association that would directly deal with the government. And the government, actually different departments of the government, transportation, business and commerce, etc., have has started to actually put mandates on this trade association as a way to regulate the uh, new field. And so this divergence in the government's approach actually really helped us in being able to compare how Uber and Airbnb strategies changed based on where they were. And then, of course, the third case is really different, and that serves like a, a, as a nice comparison because Egypt is a place where a lot of these institutions that deal with Uber and Airbnb are either not in a place or they are weak institutions. Right? And so there, the difference is really stark, and we see that when the institutions that you would normally deal with in a developed country actually are either not there or weak, then there is another way around in entering the uh, country. So in particular, let's start with the, um, the case that is very different, which is Egypt. The idea in general is that similar institutional strategies may lead to different outcomes in different institutional settings. And if the institutional setting is different, there's a better strategy for that particular uh, uh, setting. For example, when there's a lower degree of what we call institutionalization. And what that means is that you know, the, the, the institutions that, uh, that govern the society are, again, either weak or they're not there. So, you know, a certain type of ministry doesn't exist. Or it exists, but you know, the rules are not enforced. And so, for example, uh, one of the times that I was in Egypt, um, I get, got into a taxi. This was before Uber. I got into a taxi, and we started going in the middle of the road against direction. And that was okay, you know, not okay with me, but you know, okay with everyone else, it seems. And so the, the, the enforcement of laws and regulations, when that's actually weak, then that allows a different kind of strategy to come in. So when we look at the case of Uber, we see this very starkly. This is a Uber harass map, or it's kind of a badge, let's say, which actually shows that Uber is doing something against harassment, particularly in the case of women. One of the ways that you know, it, the life of women uh, is difficult in Egypt is that they can actually they refrain from using public transportation because of harassment worries. In a taxi, this situation is even worse because you can't, you can't follow taxis and you know, taxis go out to the boondocks and you know, the harassment is everywhere. And so what Uber has done is they say, okay, our differentiation is that we help solve the harassment problem. What they have done is they have put badges to show that you know, harassment is actually is something that is being condemned. And in cases where it would happen, that this would have severe consequences for the drivers. The drivers are a lot more trackable, of course, given the technology. And so that really helps in tracking the car as well as identifying the driver itself. And also checking the driver's background, of course. These are all uh, important issues. Another thing that they did was, okay, so if they were going to do that, they needed to be able to track the car. But in order to track the car, they rely on GPS, which is a bit kind of uh, not in place in, in Egypt. So they actually also invested into GPS cover, uh, cover in the country, which of course was really welcomed by the uh, country itself, by the, by the government. And in addition, 
There was also a lot of investment into making roads better, first of all, so that cars wouldn't get damaged and then everyone would have a better experience. So overall, what we see is that they actually contributed to the welfare of the society. And this type, of, this type of picture of Uber is very different, as you already are sensing, from the kind of uh, uh, stories that we know about Uber. But in a country where there's some good to do in terms of making sure that you know, women are not harassed or less harassed and you know, roads are better and there's better coverage, so everything is much more trackable, which of course helps their business as well, this is a way for them to enter. On the other hand, Imagine trying to do something like that in the UK or Netherlands. It, there's actually, in a sense, no need because these are not so much issues, right? So what do you do when the government is in place, institutions are in place, and people are protected, and, and there is incumbents that are strong, all right? So here we see a stark difference between um, Uber and Airbnb in particular. In the case of Uber, what we see is that they entered a lot more aggressively with what we call, based on uh, research um, that was done before in institutional uh, field, particularly the Robanto et al., they have talked about transformative versus additive strategies. Transformative is when you go and this is, these are again all directed at the institutional system of the country that you're entering right, or of the field that you're entering. Transformative is when you try to go in and transform the field. And this is a much more aggressive strategy, whereas additive is when you try to complement the players in the field, right? And so in the case of Uber, what we see is that they go in and they may know that they break the law, but that's not a problem. Their strategy is to actually get all the, you know, populate the platform using a bit of platform language as soon as the, the users and the providers on the platform are incentivized. And as long as you know, the platform gets populated, they feel that there's support for their service, which is also, of course, evident by the fact, for example, that in London, after it was um, I originally uh, the, the TFL decision to ban Uber services, was met with millions of people signing a petition as well as doing street protests, which, which I'll get to in a different study. But the idea is that when you have gained the attraction of both citizens and, and providers, meaning drivers, then you know, supposedly your life will be a lot easier. This has been Uber's strategy. Airbnb has been quite different. I had numerous interviews with Airbnb London, for example, where they explained how when they go into a neighborhood, they have a very specific target of making sure that they help local businesses. So making sure they promote local businesses through the app, because they obviously know the address that, that you're going to, as well as working with fire departments in order to make sure that the houses remain on highest standards for fire safety and making sure that all the systems like water, et cetera, electricity are done in a proper way. So in a sense, if you put your house on Airbnb, then you actually get some benefits in terms of the well-keeping of your house. And notice how they're addressing different departments to make sure, because the fire department obviously is working hard to make sure that all houses are fire safe so that you know, there's no tragedies. And it also actually helps, helps them save money as well. However, they have a hard time reaching citizens. Citizens are not incentivized to pay attention to these things. Through Airbnb, they are, because the better the house, the better you know, the service itself. And so this additive strategy of making sure that they address the stakeholders and that the stakeholders are better off through the entry of Airbnb has been a very successful strategy across different um, countries. Over time though, of course, as the platform grows, even Airbnb through their you know, nice additive strategy starts to have problems. So it's not that Airbnb didn't have problems at all. However, because they had a foot in the door through this additive strategy, they actually grew without resistance much longer and it was a lot easier for them to actually deal with regulators because a lot of stakeholders viewed them positively compared to Uber, where you know, the, the view from the beginning 
for all stakeholders except users and drivers was actually quite negative. And as we know, a lot of drivers are now protesting against Uber as well. On the other hand, an important question is, okay, so we're going to go in an additive way. We're going to contribute to the society as we go in. We're going to address the different institutions. That's great, but who do you go to? Do you go to the mayor? Do you go to the fire department? Do you go to the government? Do you go to the Department of Transportation? Do you go to the you know, uh, Department of Innovation and Entrepreneurship, whatever that might be? Depending on the government's approach to the situation, there's actually a different approach to follow for the market and entrant as well. And here, the difference is really between UK and Netherlands. What we see is that, as I've told you before, the UK was a lot more central in regulating the sharing economy. They've decided that they wanted to nip it in the bud in the sense that they wanted to make sure that the rules were quite clear from the beginning, and to, to be honest, still today they are not, but the regulation is a lot uh, more advanced, let's say, compared to the Netherlands, and the reason for that is that the trade association was commissioned from the beginning. It wasn't the association that just came about because entrepreneurs got together, which is typically the case. The government said, if you want to be at the table, you need to have an association, and we will only deal with the association. So that was great, you know, that worked really well. And, you know, uh, Airbnb and, um, and uh, a lot of the others started the association and went on with the association. At the same time, of course, what that does is that everything now happens through the association and that creates certain dynamics. Whereas in the Netherlands, the um, approach was much more at the municipality level because cities were deciding on what to do for, for Airbnb and Uber um, just on the, at the city level. All right. So what we see here in total is that, before I get to our struggles, what we see here in total is, of course, the role of regulation, but also that you know, there can be different approaches from both sides. From the institutional side, if the institutional uh, system decides to just let it happen and then see if it causes any problems, then the market entrance strategy, the path to entry is quite different compared to if there's a central approach, then you, know you want to be part of that debate and you want to have a kind of solid chair at that table through the association itself. Whereas if the situation is different and you know, the institutions are weak, then the stakeholders that you address with your additive strategy are actually quite different. Then you go to you know, the issues that the grand societal challenges that that society has and work with the institutions in order to help solve those. All right, now some dirt on the study itself. What did we struggle with? The cross-country comparison, of course, is not easy to sell. Why did we compare UK and Netherlands and Egypt? Well, the true story is that, of course, it has to do with access. But how do you sell that kind of setup, right? Why did we not study, you know, UK, um, I don't know, uh, Poland and, and uh, Mexico, right? That would have created a very different result. Now there, I think what's important is to really strengthen the framing by being very clear on what you're keeping constant and what you're varying and why and in what way are you varying that. And in particular, we, rely, we relied on a lot of statistics, archival information on how indexes in terms of kind of institution, institutionalization between UK and Netherlands differed and how certain departments and agencies that existed in these countries didn't exist in Egypt and showed a lot of evidence on how we were varying across just this dimension. And then of course, the second thing there was that we said, okay, we're not looking at market entry in general. We're, we're looking at market entry strategy of the platform. So we're looking at it from the platform's perspective, and that also makes it a lot cleaner because then we don't have to get into the debate uh, into debates of oh you know and then the, re the the government responded this way and then this agency said that this agency said that. We just are interested in understanding what they choose to do. So that created uh, a lot uh, and, and a lot more cleaner story and was much, much more effective in making it go through the review process. Another thing that we struggled with is obviously in some cases either sharing platforms struggle to grow 
they're not making money. So in your research, especially if you're doing research in management and particularly in the field of strategy and entrepreneurship, you may have to show that you know, there's some negative outcomes about this uh, one. And in particular, we had this case with Uber. Uber was getting banned, right? And so naturally, Uber was a lot less open to reveal the truth about what was happening compared to Airbnb. And there, what really matters is, first of all, triangulation. Make sure that you speak to enough stakeholders so that you understand what that story was and what Uber did, not just through talking with Uber, which we also did, but those interviews were less honest compared to other interviews. And so we spoke to st stakeholders to understand the truth of the story, and not just one, but several so that we understand it from a regulator's perspective, we understand it from taxi associations' uh, perspective, etc. And in addition, we used archival and so, you know, at the same time, public interviews, interviews that were published in newspapers and internet uh, kind of journals in order to support our data. Now, this is one story. Another one looks at the complete reverse, meaning, okay, these guys are coming in, Airbnb and Uber and the rest are coming in, and there are some protests around the world. Are these protests successful? What happens when there's a protest? And also, when we say a protest, what do we mean? Is a protest going on the street with a sign? Is it sitting in front of a building? Is it blocking Uber cars, which also happens? Or is it suing them for, you know, doing something illegal or, you know, that, you know, taking away my rights? What does protest mean exactly? So in this paper, again, you know, my, my lovely co-author uh, who's here, and I promise you the next study I talk about is not with him. <laughs> <laughs> so here, the, the, this paper is, it says ASQ and no date because we are under review, so please cross your fingers there. And um, here what we have is we look at whether Airb uh, Uber, particularly not Airbnb here, Uber gets banned in a country or not and why. And this is from an incumbent's perspective because what we try to explain it with is what did the incumbent do? And what is variation there? Again, keeping Uber's entry constant and looking at variation in the way that protest happened. We have a hand collected data which uh, looks at different kinds of protests across 22 European countries. And in particular, what we do with that is we look at the role of different kinds of protests. The theoretical framing here is borrowed from social movements and institutional uh, entrepreneurship. And in particular, we talk about public versus private protests, politics. And the public politics are really going through the public system. And what that means is that you file a lawsuit typically, the legal way. Whereas the private one is quite different in the sense that it actually lets you uh, do street um, protests and sitting in and strikes, etc. So it's more in the, in the, let's say, in the citizen's eye rather than you know, through an actual legal process. What do we find? What we find is that, anecdotally, a lot of taxi associations and other players that are against Uber actually try to do street protests. However, they're not effective for getting Uber banned. What's much more effective is filing a lawsuit. Why? Because the regulator that can ban Uber when you file a lawsuit, you're actually going directly at their reason for existence. So you're engaging them directly rather than through the public. And so that works much better for getting Uber banned, it turns out. The second one is that it's not just about the action itself. Do I file a lawsuit, whether it's a street process, etc., street protest, but also the kind of language I use, my reasons for protesting. And here what we see is that rather than talking about regulation or you know, tax and labor issues or unfairness, competition unfairness, etc., it works much better if you talk about the violation of the existing law specifically. 
So this is in violation of existing law, again, engages that regulator directly and says, okay, I need to be consistent here. And, and to keep the consistency, I need to act. So the action works a lot quicker this way. And then our coolness, coolest finding, which we, which we love, is what we call the Streisand effect. Let me tell you the Streisand effect uh, with, the, with this, first of all. What is the Streisand effect? In 2003, a picture of this beautiful mansion that is owned by Barbara Streisand uh, was put on um, this uh, website called Pictopia, which had a lot of, I mean, it had 50 million pictures, right? So it's not, uh, it's not, uh, it's not a whole lot, uh, it's not just this was showcased, it was just part of a website. But Barbara Streisand actually tried to sue this person in order to, you know, with the argument that it actually, um, you know, disturbed her privacy and this was, you know, just not acceptable. And, uh, the, and the, while the lawsuit was going on, her, the pictures were actually downloaded millions of times. So sh by doing that and arguing about violation of uh, privacy, she actually violated her own privacy, right? But what is the mechanism here? It's publicity, right? It's publicity, really. Because there's news about it, everybody is curious. What is what? What about Barbara Streisand's home? Why should I care? Well, you know, this is a reason. So what we see here is that similarly, when there's protests against Uber in a country, it actually has a counter effect in terms of making it less likely for Uber to be banned in the short period. This is a temporary effect, but it's actually quite interesting because it gains publicity. And what we see, for example, in the case of uh, Uber in London, this whole um, I affair with, with TFL, Transportation for London, is that the weekend after it was announced, there were many more downloads of Uber, right? So we see this publicity effect going against it. Now, so far, what do these results tell us together? They tell us that institutional environments matter and that institutional entrepreneurship, which is defined as an actor or group of actors, efforts in order to make, create a more favorable institutional environment is part of a market entrance strategy. And perhaps their most important strategy, because to be honest, the rest is platform dynamics. You need to populate the uh, uh, platform, make sure that everybody's happy on that platform. I say it as if it were easy, but you know, the rules are pretty clear about how to, by now we know how to run a platform. But what's a lot more intricate is that interplay with the state and with the institutional environment. In particular, what we see is that the regulation is obviously, you know already, it's not set in stone, but it's a dialogue. And in particular, we see the existence of what we call in research, framing contests. I talk about, you know, Uber being an information systems company. You talk about, as regulator, it being a taxi company. And then we advance the debate and have different perspectives, and at some point somebody decides, the regulator decides, but in the meantime, there's a lot of influence coming from different kinds of stakeholders. The role of timing really matters as well, just like in the case of Airbnb, first going in with a complementary additive strategy to make sure that stakeholders were happy until it grew. And obviously, at some point, somebody is going to start to be unhappy, but that gives them time in order to actually grow quite a bit without resistance. Now, to be a bit of a devil's advocate, what's new here? What's novel? The stories are interesting. The stories are from the sharing economy, but are we studying the sharing economy, really? Or are we using the sharing economy as a setting in order to study something else? Well, both are true. So first of all, what I've told you is a classic case of disruptive entry, but in a regulated market. Uh, as Kuhn also mentioned at the beginning, a lot of my research is in regulated markets. Whether it's telco, it's finance, these are all highly regulated. 
And the reason why I go into these settings is, is that because there's that non-market strategy aspect that's interesting and that is understudied typically in literature. So it's in a sense a niche that I've found, right? And I think that more and more people are doing research and there's, I mean, even just last night at the opening event, the, the issue of regulation was at the forefront of the discussion. Now, but if it's a disruptive entry into a regulated market, for example, I have another uh, study that is going on right now with a PhD student that is working at fi looking at fintech, fintech, financial technology firms entering the banking industry. Well, that's a disruptive entry in a bank in in a regulated environment as well. So, do we use the sharing economy as a setting, just as a setting, or are we actually offering a new theoretical frame? I think this is a big and important discussion to have. And here, I think that if, you, especially if you're doing management research, and if you're looking at entry of these firms and the way that you know, they grew and that they were successful, you are using sharing economy as a setting, and mostly as a setting. For example, to study platforms, to study institutional dynamics, the setting may be new and exciting, and you know, I think a lot of uh, us here are by default phenomenon-driven researchers, but we are, in terms of a theoretical flame, using something existing, which is great because there's still a lot to contribute there, but this is just a setting. What can we do that is a bit more than using the sharing economy, uh, more than a setting? At the micro level, I think the answer to that question is a lot more clear. So, for example, it's pretty clear, and one of my works, which I will talk to you about now, you know, in the interest of time, I may have to cut it a bit short, but sharing economy is shown to change people's behavior, our attitude towards things. At the same time, the way that we trust digital platforms when we see something online and whether we trust a stranger because they're sitting here or versus whether they're part of a platform, the role of ratings, all of these things are new developments that individual level research can address. And I think that it's very important for us to understand these, not just for research purposes and for contribution to, to theory purposes, but also for understanding our society, for understanding our kids. The way that they grow up is very different from the way that we grew up. And so this is extremely significant research. At the macro level, contributing or building a sharing economy theory is a lot more difficult. Because it, 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 a lot of times it is a setting for studying something that could be studied in another tech setting, for example. However, here, one of the things that we can think about maybe is what is different in the sharing economy is that, and sometimes we see this in, in the debates coming up, it's a movement, the sharing movement, right? What does that mean? It's not just in one sector. It's popping up across sectors. The dinner tonight um, is, is um, at, a, at a restaurant that, use it, that does food sharing, right? So different sectors actually are addressing this particular issue. So that gives us an opportunity to look at cross-sector dynamics. And this is one of the ways in which sharing economy research can be unique. In order to do that, for example, what we can do is that cross-sector dynamics, in particular in terms of labor, labor law, What's, different between, uh, what's the difference between uh, sharing economy platforms in one sector, like if you're a driver, for example, versus if you're you know, just giving up your parking space, etc. In terms of taxation, in terms of psychology of sharing, as I said before, and environmental studies, what is the net effect on the society? Cross-sector studies like this are going to really help in addressing some of these new um, um, issues. And sharing economy is unique in the sense that it's one of the few areas where cross-sector society is changing across sectors in the, in, in the same way, right? Within management, in order to fi uh, find the right angle, some of the things that you can study is, for example, within entrepreneurship, cross sector collaborations, ecosystems of sharing platforms working together across sectors, 
Spillovers. I'll tell you, um, you know, a few uh, words about spillovers. Some of these things are ways in which we can use the sharing economy as a unique phenomenon rather than just as an example to study something else. And another one that I like quite a bit is the reimagination of the value chain. Strategy research, in a sense, assumes that there, is a, there, there are companies in the world that exist in a particular way and that they are part of a value chain and that value chain is very clear cut. They can vertically integrate or not, etc. Fine. But what we see here is that the value chain is now being reimagined and the borders are a lot more blurry. And that is something that strategy researchers can look into as well. Now, I'm going to talk to you very, very briefly about this uh, study, which looks at something completely different, which is how do sharing, this is, you know, in the spirit of what I just told you about doing cross-sector research, how do platforms across sectors affect one another, is the question we asked here. What happens when you have a food sharing platform? How do you get affected by Airbnb, for example? Or if you're a home sharing platform that has to fight with, not fight, but compete in the same sector as Airbnb, how do you get affected? So this is a, a study that we did and the question that we asked, and we did this through a mixed method study. And we, I will skip this. We looked at um, UK sharing platforms, had many interviews with them, and then we complemented that with a consumer survey. We found, in particular, that being in the same category as a really successful platform is good for many things because that successful platform, for example, Airbnb fights for your laws, right? You know, they want to make sure that they are allowed. So if they are allowed in the same category, then you're allowed to. That's great. There's public awareness about, about it, etc. However, the problem is that if you're in that same category, you cannot differentiate in terms of your business model because the business model that is pinned in p into people's minds is the model of Airbnb. So if you do something different, for example, for the landlords, if you actually provide cleaning services in addition to, you know, just being a platform for the, for the, for the house, then that doesn't get registered because the business model is different and then the dominant business model actually continues to be what people have in their minds. So being in the same category is a mixed bag in a sense. If you're in a different category, you can use these very famous examples in order to explain and sell your business. So for example, we, we talked to a sharing website for boats, like sailing boats, and they said, we're Airbnb for boats, Airbnb for the sea very easy to explain and to sell, right? So we try to differentiate this way about what happens where, when you're within the same category versus in a different category. And we see that, you know, being in the same category is difficult, whereas being in a different category to the extent that you can differentiate yourself is actually mostly a blessing. What we struggled with, typical mixed methods, issues, the role of the survey, how important was the survey for the, for the whole thing? The story, to be honest with you, the story came through the interviews. And the survey was used as additional data to support what we found in the interviews. We had to sell that. And it worked because the paper is forthcoming now in a special issue in the research of, uh, um, of, uh, um, of uh, uh, sociological research. Um, but what happens is that, you know, when you do mixed method, giving the balance between qualitative and quantitative is a lot more difficult and typically what we see is that qual quantitative dominates and qualitative helps to explain but now this is this uh, study is reversed in the sense that the story comes out through the qualitative and the quantitative is used just as support i think that this is a good moment for uh, for me to to basically tell you um you know, just um, the challenges. This is basically a summary of everything that I've told you about in terms of the challenges. I think um, to, if I were to summarize, I can say, you know, I encourage you to think about what is the role of sharing economy in your research, whether it's just a setting or whether you're looking at something unique through, uh, through the sharing economy. And in particular, I'd like to 
encourage, and I think Kuhn's department is doing a wonderful job in that, in engaging in cross-disciplinary research because it is very impactful, because it will help us in translating the results into something good for society. But I need to warn you, publishing is not easy in that, uh, in that particular uh, track. So with that, I thank you and I open it to questions. <laughs>